Well, thank you. Thank you, Aparna. Can everybody hear me? They're supposed to turn off the microphone. So thank you for a very nice introduction. And uh, aside from the baby girl part, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so as, uh, as Greg said, um, some of us are here for uh, quite a while. I actually come, uh, I'm at Syracuse, New York, and believe me, I feel pretty lucky that I'm spending four months in Santa Barbara right now, especially this winter. I don't know, some of you may come from the East Coast. My husband is not so happy about this. He keeps sending me <laughs> text messages pointing out. <laughs> but, so we, I'm actually here for the whole program, which is actually four and a half months. So some people are here for a shorter time. And it's a lot of fun, and we work on something that we've been calling active matter or active soft matter because, indeed, it's, uh, we think of these systems as materials, but they're all materials that are soft, like soft gel or rubber or, or things like that. And uh, um, what this is all about, essentially, is trying to figure out what are the physical principles that govern the organization of... Uh, objects, entities, units that are individually driven, such as a fish, but a large scale exhibit as a kind of coordinated motion, coordinated motion or function of patterns. And uh, there is a, um, it's a, as was mentioned, is a highly interdisciplinary field, the interface between physics, biology, but also chemistry. There are mathematicians working in this field. And uh, we try to deal with system on a huge range of scales. And so what I thought I would try to do this morning, since I'm the first speaker, is sort of try to tell you a little, give you some examples of what we mean by active matter. And also some, try to give you some examples of how we go to try to actually describe these properties, because I'm actually a theorist. So I actually work some with computers, but some even with pencil and paper. And, and try to develop uh, the mathematics to try to describe the systems. So first of all, well, uh, we are all familiar with states of matter. Atoms and molecules organize themselves in solids, liquids, gases, and many more complicated and exotic phases, plasma, parnamention, liquid crystals, and so on. And they do so because of the interactions among the various atoms. And we can tune or change from one phase to another, for instance, by changing the temperature. And we have a pretty good understanding of many of these phases, at least the most familiar ones. They're actually still open questions, but we understand quite a bit there. So now suppose we have instead a collection of uh, things, of objects, of units, that are cell-propelled, such as bacteria, cells, some synthetic swimmers, birds, fish, and so on. And they do something together collectively, again, because of their interactions. Can we think of this system as a new kind of active matter? And the kind of questions we might want to ask is what new states, there might be new states that are possible, what are the properties of these states, and how, what do we change? Instead of changing temperature, what do we change and go, to go from one state to another? So that's the kind of things we, we want to ask. So let me just start with a few quick examples and then um, we've gone from there. So a simple example is the one of bacteria. So this is E. coli, and a little later today, in fact, at the second talk, Jeff Guasto will actually tell you a lot more about how individual bacteria actually swim, which is very interesting. This is E. coli. E. coli is a body about two to five micron long, a long tail of flagella, and it swims by a characteristic motion which has been called run and tumble because it goes in a straight line for a while, see this one, then it spreads out its tail and it changes direction quite substantially, then it goes in a straight line again. And uh, uh, E. coli typically swims at a speed, say, of about 10 micron per second, so this is a fairly dilute suspension of E. coli. When you have a many E. coli together, a dense suspension of E. coli, the behavior is really quite different. If you feed them well, give them a lot of food, put them a rich substrate, they swirl around and they look like, this looks sort of like a turbulent fluid, a fluid undergoing turbulence. In fact, these people have called this bacterial turbulence. And they keep swimming around like this, and this, there's a lot of swirly motion here, lots of vorticity. And, uh, well, why do they do this, and how can we describe this motion? If you actually starve them, or in, in various ways, they actually can form very complex patterns, as you can see here, this dotted pattern, or this other even more complex pattern. 
And again, how do these bacteria organize into this kind of structure? So how do we go from the physics of one to the organization of many, which is similar to what we think about when we think of material? So remarkably, the kind of dynamics that we have seen in the well-fed E. coli, it's very similar to the dynamics you see if you put a monolayer of rods. These are actually copper clippings. They're all the same. Each copper clipping, I think, is about half a millimeter in length. Um, they are on a horizontal plane, which is vibrated vertically at some frequency, fairly low amplitude. This is about 2,000. This is actually precisely, sorry, they were counted, 2,820 rods. The whole thing is 13 centimeters in diameter. So, sorry, it's up 5 millimeters, the length of the rod. And uh, um, again, lots of swirly motion, very similar kind of patterns. Yes, and please, do ask questions anytime. Yes. I'm just wondering, in the crowded places, are they stacking on top of No, these are not. These are actually... Um, because they're vibrated at a very, very small amplitude. The amplitude of vibration, I forgot exactly what it is, but it's a tiny fraction of, of the thickness of these rods. So it's, uh, and it's actually important that they be a monolayer for, for these. And by the way, I should say that I have freely stolen from all my colleagues their work and their images and movies, and I further decided not to actually even mention their names for two reasons. <laughs> One, they're typically not here, not here other than a few, but, uh, and two, probably, they, they think they're very famous, but I think you probably wouldn't know their names, but what I have done is try to put uh, uh, the place where the work was done, and so you can read it there. This work was done actually in Bangalore in, uh, in India. Um, another example, cells. Javier Trepa, later today, in this afternoon, will tell a lot more about this. In individual cells, this is a fibroblast uh, from a chicken. I've cheated slightly. It's actually two different types of cells, but let me be a little loose here. With So this is a fibroblast, uh, which is a part of the connective tissue from, a, from a, a chick embryo. Cells actually move. They move on substrates, for instance much more slowly than E. coli, this total movie duration is two hours. So we are on a very different kind of scale here. If you pack many cells together, these are endothelial cells packed at very high density so that there is really no empty space. Then, again, you see motions. We see, again, some of these swirly motions. This movie is looped is very short in duration because it actually took several hours to take because these cells move much, much more slowly than E. coli, 35 micron per hour. What the, the, the dots, the, the sort of bright places are actually cell divisions. There are some, but not that many. But to a physicist, this kind of dynamics on this kind of slow time scales looks a lot like the dynamics you see in a, what's called the supercooled dense liquid, a very viscous liquid near the glass transition. And so um, is is a tissue a liquid or a solid? That's a question we can ask. Or perhaps the most proper way to say is that we see the tissue often behave sort of like a viscoelastic liquid, like silipati. It flows if you stretch it very slowly, but if you um, um, make a ball out of it, you can bounce it off the table, then it behaves elastically. So another type of sort of living material we would like to understand. And finally, the example that uh, Greg mentioned at the beginning. Um, this is a starling of flocks. This is actually also a movie. Um, a collaboration in, uh, based in Rome called the Starfly Collaboration spent several years um, taking data from flocks of starlings, uh, ranging in size from 200 to 50,000 starlings, and uh, analyzing them with a computer to try to essentially reverse engineer the interactions that drive this kind of behavior. And as I, will, as I will try to show you, they were actually quite successful. And now we have some better understanding of uh, this type of so-called flocking behavior. This happens without a leader. There is no leader. Um, and the question one really wants to understand is how do these starlings man manage to communicate information so quickly? 
the speed at which information is transmitted to the flock is much larger than the reaction time of, of an individual starling. And so something else happens here collectively that drives this type of organization, this type of motion. The, um, the flock itself looks sort of like a soft, deformable body or sort of a fluid that moves around in the sky. So <clears throat> again, how can physics help us understand all of these, or can, can physics help us understand all of these? And what I would like to do is to go through three examples of how we try to go about this, or maybe two, we'll see. <laughs> so first of all, about, tell you a bit about something called the Bichek model of flocking, so how we model actual flocking. Then we'll go to a very different scale. We'll go inside the individual cell and tell you about something we call active liquid crystals. And then maybe if I have time, I'll tell you about the strange properties of what we call an active gas. So a system of these moving particles, but a very low density. So let's start with the flocking. Um, back in, uh, uh, actually, 1987, Craig Reynolds, um, a computer scientist working for the animation industry, developed a model, um, a computer-based model, that was intended for uh, uh, describing, for, be used, for be used, uh, to, to produce animation, and was actually used with some variation to describe, to produce things like the wildebeest stampede in The Lion King, as an example. Um, a few years later, a Hungarian physicist, Tomasz Vicek, he actually did not know about Craig Reynolds' work, but he was actually interested in trying to describe bird flocking. And he, sort of reinvented, without knowing, reinvented actually Craig Reynolds' model. And now we physicists actually refer to this model as the VCHEC model. But credit really should originally go to Craig Reynolds. Now, Tomasz Vichak was actually interest, interested in also understanding more precisely why this, uh, this model actually works the way it does. And I'll tell you what the model is in a minute. And uh, he was a, uh, what we call a condensed matter physicist. He worked on properties of materials. And so in building the model, he was actually inspired by what he knew about magnetism. Um, we know that magnetic properties of material can roughly be understood by thinking that each one of the atoms carries a little magnetic moment. And uh, at high temperature, the magnetic moments may be all pointing in different directions, so the system doesn't have an average magnetization. But as you say, for instance, lower the temperature, they might all order in a fixed direction in space, and the system becomes a magnet. Now, why does this happen? It happens because of interaction. One of these magnetic moments essentially provides a magnetic field, which is felt by the neighboring magnetic moment and tends to make them align with each other. And of course, this the moving around the magnetic moment, I mean, getting it to rotate requires some energy, and so these interactions become effective at low temperature, and that's why we get this kind of phase transition. This is an example of what we call in physics a phase transition, like uh, liquid freezing into ice. And we have a pretty good understanding of how this happens and, and why. So what we just said is that, OK, so suppose we bird, we, let's take a bird. Physicists like to simplify. And so we take a bird and we model it as a magnetic moment, or as we call it, a spin. So a bird is equal to a vector. It's really, though, a velocity vector, not a magnetic moment. And it's a velocity vector that can move, that can fly. It's a flying spin. It has a fixed speed, a fixed length. And the only thing, the only degree of freedom, the only thing that can change is the direction in which it travels. And uh, so that's for one. So now let's see <clears throat> what are the interaction rules that Vichek chose to specify. They're actually very, very simple. He said, well, at every step, each bird looks at the neighbors within a circle in two dimensions or a sphere in three dimensions of a fixed radius and aligns with them. So if I am going in the opposite direction to all my neighbors, I will look around, I will correct and align with my neighbors, and then I go on in that direction. And then at the next time step, I check my neighborhood again, and I repeat the process. However, birds make mistake, mistakes. And so this alignment is not perfect. So I align with my neighbor, but I always make some mistakes. 
which means there is noise in the problem. The noise is sort of the size of the mean of the mistakes that the birds make. And it acts sort of like a temperature acts in the real material. And what you find if you actually write down equations for these models and try to, you can, for instance, put them on a computer and integrate them, you find that indeed this model exhibits a phase transition as a function of the strength of the noise. If the noise is large, the birds make a lot of mistakes, it's always in a disordered state, like the spin, when the system is not magnetized, they're flying in all directions. But when the noise is small enough, the, uh, the actual spins order, they actually form a flock. And this happens at a well-defined value of the noise, just like the transition from a disordered magnetic system to a ferromagnetic system happens at a very precise value of temperature. So I just thought, yeah. So what's the parameter which makes that transition? There is temperature. The noise, the noise. The noise is, so what I said is that, you know, I, I, I look at my neighbors, I align with them, but not exactly there are some, I make some mistakes. So maybe I don't know, maybe I'm supposed to go, um, I don't know, in this direction. Well, actually, there's a bit of a mistake. I actually go in that direction. Now, the amplitude of the mistakes that I allow in my, in my system, that's what I call the noise. So okay. it's more like a biological thing rather than physics, isn't it? Uh, that is true. So this is a, what we call a rule-based model. And in fact, a question that I personally have been working on for quite some time, although I wasn't planning to tell you about it, is can we get the same kind of behavior if instead of having these, which are really like points with an arrow, we actually have physical quantity. For instance, suppose these were rods that are actually with a physical size that are traveling in this direction. Rods actually do align just because they're elongated and they take up space. So can that model also give you some phase transition like this? And it turns out the answer is partly yes and, and so on. So, but this is a rule-based model. Yes? What about wing size? What about? Wing size. Oh, there's nothing, as, as I said, you know, the bird becomes a point carrying an arrow. I mean, people are looking at that too, and, and, and there are, but for now, this is the, what we call the minimal model you could possibly make that gives you something interesting. Of course, there are lots and lots of other things you can add and, and worry about, and you should, okay? But that's it's a different, different. But, you know, to, it, it's sort of interesting that this really simple model will actually give you something something interesting. Let, let me actually show you what it does. I, I'm, I'm, I hope this will work. Let's see. Okay. Ah, it worked. Ah, oh, okay. So what uh, I, I actually found uh, a simulation on the web, uh, which is made by scientists at the University of St. Thomas in Minnesota. I was already excited because I thought I'd make contact with them. I thought it was the Virgin Islands, but it's Minnesota. So, uh, ah, does it look like I did something bad here? Now probably, okay. Let's see if we can at least go back. Oh, now we're completely stuck. Yeah, okay. So I wanted to show you the actual simulation. I don't know, I can try again, but I suspect. Okay. Okay, so um, this is a, a simulation of this model. The only parameter is the noise. So we set the noise. Let's put a high noise, first of all. We set the noise and then run it. And let's see what happens. These birds, which are last points carrying an arrow, they're, that's all they are. They're going in all different directions. They're not doing anything particularly interesting. But now let's see what happens when we decrease the noise. Some value. They flock, right? <laughs> now remember, there are no attractive interaction of any kind here. That's really the point that is interesting. There are no attractive interaction of any kind. The only interaction, but, but there is a rule which is really not very physical. This is true. Yes. This is 2D. People have done 3D, but this is, this is 2D. Yes. Yes. So you can go and play with it. Uh, now let's see if we can recover. Ah, 
okay, we got coffee up here. Amazing. <laughs> okay. Yes. Yes, they can. They don't. They can even run over each other. Yes, they're just point particles like ideal gas. You know, this is an ideal gas of worlds. Yes. Yes. So that's actually a very interesting issue. Um, only for noise exactly equal to zero, they will all go in the same direction with, um, you know, an homogeneous kind of, of way. Any fine amount of noise, there is a critical amount of, uh, so you want to actually quantify this. What you would measure is the mean velocity of the worlds, right? If the mean velocity is zero, they are disordered. If the mean velocity is non-zero, they are ordered. There is indeed a critical value of the, mean, of the noise where the mean velocity goes actually discontinuously from being like a first, what's called a first order phase transition, like uh, water going into ice, goes from being non-zero to being zero, okay? But the order state, as we call it, is always one that has these really big density fluctuations. It's not uniform. It's not everybody moving. There are these big density fluctuations that, that look sort of like flux. And there's been a lot of work on this and trying to understand why. And I can tell you more about it later, if, if that's OK. All right. So now, one really interesting thing the Rome group that studied starlings actually did is they tried to use this model. So they actually took tons of data. They took a lot of images, snapshots of flocks, millions and millions of them, and then tried to put them on a computer. Of course, the very hard thing, it took them years to figure out. I mean, imagine you have two snapshots of, of a, um, a flock. The birds are just black dots. What you need to know is who is who. You need to know the one that was here now before, who, with, where, where, where is he now, right? That was very hard. That was a very hard computational pro problem that they solved using optimization techniques. And though they were able then to try to reproduce the observations using this type of model, a little bit, some more ingredients in it, but essentially this type of model. And by doing that, what they uh, realized is an interesting thing, which is that actually the model works fairly well, but with one change. And the change is that uh, birds actually do not interact with their neighbors within, and here I'm always using two dimensions, um, do not interact with their neighbors in uh, a circle of fixed length, but they always interact with the closest starlings, at least. Starlings always interact with the closest six or seven neighbors. And this makes a difference, especially if you are, if the nest is low or you are sort of the edge of the flock as you can kind of, I've tried to kind of sketch here. And presumably, this ingredient is what allows the flock to be so robust, for instance, to respond so quickly to a predator. Here is a, was a falcon. Now, the falcon is flying away, but you must have seen some time flocks attract by, um, attacked by predators, and the flock falls, but then manages to stay connected or, very, or reconnect very quickly. So this type of interaction, which we call topological interaction, is what provides robustness to, to the flock. And although it's true that this kind of model is uh, based on a rule which is not a physical interaction, understanding this kind of model requires the tools of what in physics we uh, call statistical mechanics, which is the behavior of many interacting things at a large scale. And so that's why even these kind of models, we, we think of it as, as physics. But there has also been a lot of work to try to incorporate physical interactions, such as, for instance, the fact that actually a bird, or even more so a bacteria or a cell, take up a finite amount of space. They actually cannot pass through each other the way these point particles do, and as well as other um, interactions. And uh, um, all kinds of interesting effects come out there as well. I'm actually probably going to go through only two examples, but I just thought for fun I was going to show you this movie, which is actually a movie made by Ian Cousin, from, uh, um, <clears throat> from a biologist from Princeton for the BBC. Um, and uh, it shows a combination of real flocks and schools and so on, and then it switches to simulations obtained, uh, made by Ian Cousin for these kind of systems, using models which are similar 
perhaps a bit more sophisticated, I presented to you sort of the bare bones, simplest model, but they're similar to the kind of model I described. And it's just a few minutes, but it's, it's kind of fun. Ian Cousin was actually one of the organizers of our program. He couldn't come, but at least I got his movie. Okay, now it does gonna run. Oh, come on. Okay. And now we go to the computer. There is actually, if you're ever interested in showing this to somebody, there is actually a full-length movie um, available that discusses this kind of, and uh, I don't have the, I can, I can find it if anybody is, is interested. But, uh, so. And Ian is a biologist. He actually um, studies uh, uh, f uh, swarms of locusts. He also studies, does a lot of experiments on fish in the lab in tanks. And, um, and then tries to model the behavior he sees using this kind of models. So yes. It, it, it may not. And I mean, first of all, um, you know, what they thought about was for starlings, and actually we learned that our conference yesterday works for similar models work for midges. Not birds, <laughs> okay, but uh, it certainly is true that not every every bird uh, um, flocks in this particular way. Even geese, they form a very different type of formation. Then you know this kind of model doesn't work. Um, biologists and zoologists are studying um, more in detail the interaction and behavior of of birds in the condition of small when when the numbers are small. Uh, physicists haven't really looked at that yet, but yes, you're right. Yes. Say it again, sorry. No, the the predator I is, no it, no no the predator is not so actually what's really important here is I see there is no magnetic field, right? The ordering occurs spontaneously. That's a very important notion because it's not that you apply it's not that you do something like in the in the magnet you apply magnetic field and the system orders. Here the order occurs spontaneously. You just change this parameter, the noise, which I, I like to think of as almost like a temperature, and spontaneously the system orders. So the, 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 the predator, yeah, the pred I showed you the predator because what I wanted to do to, to, uh, to say there was to point out that we think this type of interaction is the one that allows the flock to remain robust and cohesive. <coughs> when something like a predator comes in is one of the ingredients that allows the information to be propagated as quickly as it does through the flock. Yes. Oh, okay. Could be. I mean, the, the truth is, we don't know. We would like to know why they do this. We don't know why. <laughs> we are just trying to describe how, but we certainly, we certainly don't know why. I should also say that fish is actually quite different. For fish, um, for birds, at least for starlings, it looks like air is there. Made, you know, you might think that there is something in physics we call. Actually, Jeff will tell you about. We call hydrodynamic interactions. If I'm a fish and I swim here, I generate a flow, a wake, and that might influence my neighbor fish. Okay? For fish, that's probably important. For birds, it seems that it's not. And so um, fish are actually a little bit of a different story. <laughs> Some, uh, they, that, that might direct the migration, but this is not, I'm not talking about migration. I'm just talking, these, uh, the starlings do this kind of behavior, you know, this flocking, 
hitchhike in Rome for about uh, half an hour every night near sunset. That's what they do. They're not going anywhere. <laughs> they just, they're just there. But again, we don't know why. I'm not, you know, not trying to say, I'm not trying to say that we understand why. Okay, that's, that's a different, different story. Okay, so um, I would like to tell you a second story here, and I don't think I'll get to the third, but I'll tell you the second story. And we're going to go to a very different scale. We're going to go inside the cell now and, and look at what happens there. So we have an active system now inside the cell. And uh, what I want to argue is that what we're going to see is what I would like to call an active liquid crystal. So let me spend a minute on what is a liquid crystal. Actually, I'm sure you all know the liquid crystal is what drives what is at the base of your, your displays, of your computer and cell phones and so on. But the simplest of liquid crystal is, is the following. If you had a collection of rod-like molecules, this system can actually order, can, it's, a, it's a liquid, elongated rod-like molecule, can exist in two states. It can exist in a state where the rod-like molecule point in all directions, and therefore this is a liquid with no particular order. We call it an isotropic liquid. Or either as you increase the density or you lower the temperature, depending on the material, the rods may actually order in a fixed direction of space. Clearly, this system has no, it's not like my, my birds, my arrows before. These are just rods. They don't have an arrow. Or if you like, you could think of them as having two arrows. Because there is only a preferred a prefer orientation, not a preferred direction. This way is the same as that way. Okay? This is called a pneumatic liquid crystal. And um, it's very easy to understand if you were to try to pick up a lot of pencils on the table. Now, pencils do have a point, so let, but let's forget that. If you like, like to pick up a lot of sticks on a table, simply because the sticks take up space, you will see that they eventually get high density. They, it, it's easy for, to pack them when they are pointing all in the same direction of space. So this effect can arise simply because the sticks or these molecules take up space, essentially, so as you increase the density. So that's, that's a pneumatic liquid crystal. However, order, this order of these molecules is never perfect. And this is actually an uh, image from a 1949 issue of Life magazine showing the result of a strike of lumber worker in Finland, <laughs> as a matter of fact. These are logs going down the Kemi River in northern Finland. And there is a lot of alignment locally. There is, there is some order. But there is also a lot of what we call, in physics, topological defects or defects. But the structure, so the region where these things are not aligned, actually turns out have a very well-defined geometry or topology that uh, we can understand and describe. For instance, here you see they're kind of coming together. It's almost like a triangle here of three, re three aligned regions coming together. And of course, this is a bit of a cheat because the river, the river is flowing. But I thought it was a nice photo. I, when I found it on the web, I couldn't resist showing it. So, OK. so. That's a liquid, pneumatic liquid crystal, it's called. Now let's go inside the cell. If you, here is an image of a cell, many cells actually. So what you see stained in blue is the nucleus. What you see stained in green, so it's a cell. So there's a cell membrane, sort of like a bag, right? And inside there's actually a lot, there's, there's, there are lots of proteins, lots of things. So but so the things I want to focus on are what is here stained in green and in red, which are in particular the ones stained in green, which are, um, I think, yeah, which are um, called microtubules. They are very long uh, filaments, protein, which are filamentary, so very, very long rods, flexible but actually fairly stiff, that form a network inside the cell and there are actually various types. There are something called microtubules. There are something called actin. There is something called intermediate filaments. And all together, they form a network that sort of provides the cell its rigidity. It's called the cytoskeleton. It sort of serves as, I call it, muscle and skeleton to the cell, in some sense, because it also determines the mechanical properties of the cell. So they're really long filaments. 
And they are also cross-linked. There are also a lot of very small protein inside the cell. And some of them uh, bind together two of these filaments. We say cross-linked two filaments. So that you really have a very dense polymer network in there. Now, these filaments, so what people have done here, the group at Brandeis has extracted these microtubules, these filaments from a cell, and put them in a suspension in water. And what you see here is that this is an image of the microtubules, or actually these are bundles of microtubules. And you see a lot of order, of pneumatic order, a lot of alignment, and you see some of these defects I was alluding to before. So this is a pneumatic, just like the logs. This is a pneumatic of defects, but it's made of uh, polymers or proteins that are extracted from living cells. Now, there's another ingredient inside the cell. Yes? So you just throw them in water and they're kind of on a very thin... Well, what, this is much more complicated than that because these are actually bundles. But what, you're actually, what you would do is take the protein, which is called tubulin, which is like the monomer, and then it aggregates, forming the, fi the filaments in a rather complex way. So if you actually want to, if, but this is a little bit more involved than that. And I can tell you precisely how it's done a little bit later. So but there are other, many other things inside the cell. But one thing that is very interesting to us is a class of protein called uh, uh, motor protein. And in particular, there is one called kinesin, which, uh, which is uh, relevant here. Motor proteins are truly molecular machines. They are small proteins, globular proteins. They are capable of binding to say, so here it's a very tiny image of a microtubule with a motor protein bound to it. These motor proteins are capable of transforming chemical energy into mechanical work, change their shape, and literally walk along these microtubules. A cluster of these motor proteins can cross-link to microtubules and walk on one and on the other, and therefore continuously remodel the network. To do this, they need the fuel, which is ITP, ATP, adenosine triphosphate, which is the fuel. What they do, they use the chemical energy from the hydrolysis of ATP to fuel themselves. So what this uh, uh, group did, they threw together in a dish microtubules, kinesin, and the fuel. And they generated a pneumatic, but this is an active pneumatic because what happens is that it just continuously flows. It has self-sustained flows, and these flows are present without, you know, you're not applying any forces, you're not shearing the system, you're not applying any pressure. This just comes from the energy that is fed at the microscopic level by these motor proteins through the consumption of ATP. And this fuels these continuous motions that actually resemble continuous motions that goes on inside cells, I should say especially in plant cells, which are called cytoplasmic streaming. And this, this resembles that, that kind of motion. What is interesting about this kind of motion is that you see that they pres there is this, there's lots of this folding and, and refolding. There is a lot of pneumatic order, and these defects places where the orientation is bent a lot, but with a very precise topology. There is this one is very triangular, and this one that looks like a comet. You see the defects? There are two types of defects here, if you look at this for a while. There's a comet-like defect and a triangle-like defect, and nothing else, really. And they seem to be moving around and almost driving this motion. You could, could think of it that way. Is this computational? Or no, no, this is an experiment. Okay. This is an experiment. Uh, this is, I think, dark field microscopy. So it's, 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 it's optical microscopy, essentially, yes. Um, even more remarkable is what happened. So that was, by the way, I should have said, yes, this is a suspension of these microtubules plus kinase and plus ATP. It's confined at an oil-water interface. And so it's like a two-dimensional layer of this pneumatic fluid. But what they also do is that they take this, this stuff this, uh, that they extracted from cell, and they confine it inside something called a vesicle. A vesicle is uh, <clears throat> like a droplet, but is made of two layers of lipid molecules. Lipid molecules are actually the main constituent of the cell membrane. So this is like a 
uh, in, in vitro model for the cell membrane. Of course, the cell membrane has a lot of other proteins, uh, proteins embedded in it, but here is just lipid molecules. These lipid molecules have uh, a head and a tail. One likes water, and the tail dislikes water. And so if you throw them in water, they aggregate in these vesicles, which I'm trying, this is a cartoon showing that it's really like a droplet. There is room inside, essentially, as I'm trying to say. So if you actually put that active pneumatic inside a vesicle, then what you get is, which is sort of started, because after all, this active fluid inside the cell is confined. It doesn't sit at the oil water interface. Then uh, this is what you see. You see, first of all, the fluid actually goes to the surface of the vesicle. And then you see, again, all this stream in motion driven by four defects that are four of these comet-like defects that are highlighted here and that keep moving around in a very regular fashion at a frequency that you can actually tune precisely by controlling the concentration of the fuel of ATP. Yes? Temperature is pretty much, um, they, you know, temperature, nobody, people, they haven't changed the temperature. And generally, the, when people are doing experiments with biological systems, cells or ex cell extra, extras, it's very, temperature is not uh, very important. So you don't really, because after all, living systems are pretty much maintained at sort of the same temperature, at least if you want them happy and alive. So temperature is not a parameter that people uh, change here. What they change is the concentration of the fuel, which is what drives this kind of motion. So what's the point here? Oh, and now what I wanted to show you um, is that we have actually described this complex, mo this kind of motion by essentially using a continuum model, uh, essentially taking the equations for fluid dynamics, adding to the equation, equation of fluid dynamics, maybe equation for a flow velocity and the density field. We need to add something that will describe the local orientation of these filaments, and then something that will describe the energy input through this fuel, the ATP, that drive the motion. So we modify the equations of hydrodynamics to do that. And then we actually can do some analytical work, or we can try to solve them numerically. And what I'm going to show you here is uh, um, a movie showing you the solution of these hydrodynamic equations. What these lines are, they describe, so these are equations also for a quantity that describes the local alignment of the microtubules. And these lines describe the local alignment of the microtubules in our equations. The colors actually describe how strong the order is. If the system is really ordered, everybody pointing in the same direction, then it's red. And if the system is everybody point disordered, everybody pointing in different directions, then it's blue. So we start out with a configuration that actually has two of these defects, one of the comet-like and one of these sort of triangular-like objects, okay? And then we let it run from there. And what happens at the beginning is something that actually we understand from equilibrium physics. These two defects are like charges. They attract each other, and they annihilate. But then all hell breaks loose, and you see defects are regenerated, and the system is folding, and you see the motion is very, very similar to the, to the one we had in the previous experiment. Now, why are we doing this? But the experiment and this kind of work. What one is trying to do here is actually to try to get a quantitative understanding of what you would call things that are, you know, the characterized living systems. I mean, one of them, for instance, is uh, spontaneous motion. I mean, living systems can move by themselves, right? And so we have, we've got, but by combining experimental and theoretical studies, we're really trying to take apart the cell and reproduce some of the things the cell does in vitro, because if we do it in this controlled way, we may then be able to provide some theoretical quantitative understanding of what's happening. And the long-term hope is that we might be able to eventually learn from these to um, build new materials that may actually mimic living, living systems to some extent. So that's the. Now, I think I've taken all too much time already. I was going to show you 
um, the bacteria don't understand thermodynamics. Um, maybe I'll just show you two slides. And we actually, this is something we understand quite well, as a matter of fact. Um, I'll just show you two slides just for, and then we can ask about it later. Of course, everybody knows that if you put a gas in half of a container and then you make an opening, the gas will fill the container. And it really doesn't matter what the shape of the opening is. And in equilibrium, the density will be uniform everywhere, and things are pretty boring. Bacteria are quite different. This is an experiment done by a group at Princeton where uh, they actually put a barrier here made of little wedge-shaped objects like these. So you have these wedges here. It's a little hard to see. And they have openings. The openings are definitely larger than the bacteria. I mean, they're, they're, I can't remember the size, but it's not. Uh, um, I mean, this is 200 microns, so you know, one of these openings could be maybe 50, 50 microns or something. They're not, they're not that small. And then uh, bacteria on both sides, and then you wait a while. And what happens after a while is that there are many more bacteria on this side than on this side. So if you plot the density as a function of time in the right chamber, my right, your right too, because I'm facing this way. <laughs> the density goes up in time, goes down on this side, and goes up on this side. So nothing like the gas. You end up with a system that builds up density of one of the two sides of the container. And this behavior really is dictated by the shape of this barrier. If the barrier was flipped over the other way, then the density would be high on that side. Okay? So why does this happen? Um, okay, let me just show you one, one thing. We can actually understand this and many other peculiar things these uh, uh, so-called these bacteria or cell-propelled things do in a, very, in a very simple way. So you're all familiar with Brownian motion, grain of pollen in air. They go around, you know, they go around some kind of random directions all the time. On average, they don't go anywhere, but they have this, this complicated agitation and so on. Well, E. coli, as we saw at the beginning, is actually a little bit different. It does this run and tumble, goes in a straight line for a while, then changes direction, goes in a straight line for a while, changes direction. So, and we can actually make a model of so what I call a self-propelled particle, a little ball with an arrow that travels, has the dynamics of E. coli as opposed to the dynamics of uh, a random a Brownian particle, a pollen in air. And uh, if this particle, if I choose that the time it spends traveling in a, in a straight line is large enough compared to the, the rate at which you know, it changes direction, then I can actually show that uh, um, Effectively, this particle is sort of like as if it was attracted to a wall. Now, this is just a billiard ball. There's no attractive interaction of any kind. It's just its dynamics. Because the dynamics has these sort of long stretches, it's almost as uh, it, it, it can be sort of attracted to a wall. And if the wall is the right shape, this particle will actually be much more likely to go through the opening this way than a similar particle will be to go through the opening the other way. This doesn't happen for a brown, for your grain of pollen that kind of goes, hits the wall, flies off again in a random direction. And this is a model we have been studying. Um, we put a gas of these, uh, we call them self-propelled particles in a box. Actually, this one is just a regular gas in a box. Oops, what did I do? Okay. This, this is just a regular gas in a box at some temperature. The atoms are moving around, hitting the walls of the container. These are just final size billiard balls. They repel each other when they touch each other, and nothing particularly exciting. But if you put these bacteria-like self-propelled particles in the same bo box with this funny run and tumble kind of dynamics, they behave as if they were attracted to the wall. This is, they end up in this totally spatially inhomogeneous state where they accumulate at the wall. And so, the, their behavior is really very different from the ones we are used to, which is driven by temperature, by thermal fluctuations. And this leads to all kinds of interesting effects. People have proposed that these bacteria will be able to, and actually have demonstrated experimentally, 
that uh, bacteri a bacterial bath can actually drive the motion of small gears placed a gear that can make them turn in a bath. Um, so you see this for other uh, bacteria, uh, absolutely you see for certain, uh, we had a talk uh, a few days ago where somebody was showing the same behavior for an alga called chlamydomonas. So you see it provided the, the thing you're interested in uh, has a dynamics where they, uh, they do long flights and changes of direction, provided the time they spend going straight is long enough, you know, compared to some other characteristic time in the problem. So yes, absolutely. So I will stop here. I will just leave you with some questions, actually, I thought, that we are uh, asking, uh, we're trying to answer. And so first of all, sort of the general question I raised at the beginning, how does nature organize individual active units to create this kind of coherent motion, but also function in cells of, and tissues also have precise functions at a, lar at a large scale? Can we use? whatever we learn, the organizing principles that nature has put together to actually perhaps build new materials or new tiny machines. And conversely, there is actually a number of synthetic living-like systems that people are building, micro-swimmers, for instance, nano-swimmers, and so on. I did not tell you anything about those, but there are lots of them. And the advantage of those is they can actually be studied in the lab under very controlled ways. They're much simpler than cells, say. And so perhaps uh, we can learn from those, and maybe what we can learn from these systems can teach us something about how living systems actually work. So these are the kind of questions we are struggling with and will be working on for the next few months here and for much longer back in Syracuse <laughs> in the cold. <laughs> So thank you, and uh, I hope there are more questions. Yeah. You had a question? No. Uh, because of the way we record, uh, you have to wait to get the microphone. Uh, and I will run to you as quickly as I can. Um, some of the images you were showing us in the videos look um, a lot like plasma motion and they look a lot like self-assembly of nanoparticles, but because those aren't um, self-propelled, are they related? Or? Well, uh, so, you know, images where things are moving around, <laughs> they tend to look all the same. Right. So I think uh, this field, one of the problems with this field, to tell you the truth, that we're starting to address now is that for a long time, um, we made, we kept making all these movies or watching all these movies and they all look the same. And mm -hmm. what we are trying to do now is to actually make our understanding more quantitative. So, but I would say that the difference is sort of the last two movies I showed you in some mm -hmm. sense. Uh, you know, the first part of the movie, both these particles were just moving around. And I cannot tell whether what's moving them around is temperature, maybe very high temperature, like in a plasma, but this was low, but doesn't matter or what's moving them around is the fact that they are internally propelled, that they consume energy and they generate motion, okay? So there is a part of the movie where you couldn't tell the difference, but if you wait long enough, then you can see the difference. So they are very different, actually, but you have to ask specific questions to see the difference, I would say. And if you just look at images, sometimes you can see the difference. That, that's very true. Other questions? Yeah, I was wondering, um, <clears throat> most of the images you showed, of course, were with birds and fish, which can move three-dimensionally in the medium in which they exist. Has anything been done to study, um, like, large mammals, quadrupeds, uh, to see if we see similar type of yes. motions yes, like yes, that? Yes, people are doing that, and, and yes, they are, see, they are seeing similar type of behavior, right? I just felt there was only so many animal pictures I, <laughs> or movies I wanted to show you. <laughs> but absolutely, and yes, that's, that's a very good point. Those indeed are two-dimensional. And so far, most of the models, not the ones for the birds for flocking, but most of the models we are studying have been in two dimensions. And so you're right, actually, that's, that's something. I haven't personally worked on that, but that's certainly something that people that people are working on and are using this kind of models to understand, you know, um, yeah. A question over here. 
Yes. In your talk, you mentioned a couple of different mechanisms of, about uh, what would cause this kind of flocking. One of them was the kind of the shape of the object, the pencils that you were talking about, and the other was kind of the run and tumble way that the bacteria moves. Uh, is Are there a handful of three or four or five characteristics that you think kind of dominate this sort of behavior? So um, I would say that the, cru the crucial one is uh, what I call the run and tumble. And I, uh, because that's at the single particle. So one, a crucial thing at the single particle level is this, what I call run and tumble dynamics, meaning a dynamics that is different from the one of, again, the pollen in air that has a sort of a straight motion for a while and then a change in direction. The change in direction doesn't need to be as drastic as it is, say, for E. coli. It can be a more gentle one, but that's, that's essentially the feature. Concerning this, the shape, I mean, one of the things we are trying to do, actually, is precisely, I think, what you are alluding to, which is to classify the type of behavior, okay? And, and that is, in some sense, very, the kind of classification we are moving towards is very much based on sort of a combination of shape and mechanism of motion, which is essentially the following. The first system I showed, um, I had these arrows, like these magnets, and they can order, and, and in this case, they can order in a state that is also moving in one direction. And you know, this way is different from this way. There is a broken symmetry there. And, and, and that's one class of systems, systems that are on average moving and are described, if you want to describe them, you're describing by a vector, something that has both an orientation and a direction. The second class of system, when I showed you these logs and then this, what I call the nematic, that's actually systems that are moving, but they're really not going anywhere. They might actually be moving, some cells do this, they might be moving back and forth. These microtubules, when they are acted upon by the motor protein, actually do that. They kind of move back and forth. So there is what we call active motion, but they're not going anywhere. So then the state that you see, if I were to average over the entire system, the mean velocity will be zero, always. So that's not a good, what we call order parameter, something to distinguish order state from disorder state. But there is a lot of this mean, mean flow. So one of the crucial things to, to is, is whether you're talking about particles that are actually going somewhere individually, or are talking about particles that are just active, maybe because they go back and forth individually. And both these ingredients can give you this, this kind. I don't know if I answered your question, but we can talk some more about this. <laughs> Uh, I'm wondering when you are looking at your motor molecules in a um, solution that is enabling them to, uh, you know, change ATP to ADP, and you know, uh, are you looking at the opportunity to uh, look at the folding of molecules with an increase or decrease in uh, the amount of available energy through ATP, and then see how different, uh, you know, protein structures can evolve? And do you have any, uh, you know, sort of state variables like enthalpy or entropy that you coordinate with this? So um, I, I, I haven't looked at this at all. So understanding, you know, the fold, protein folding is a big problem in physics. And there are lots of people working on that. Um, I, I, haven't, I, haven't, I haven't worked on this at all. And that's not what I was referring to when I was talking about. Here I'm really talking about protein that can change shape. They can, you know, they, they're small proteins. Uh, actually, they're not, and, and they, they, might, they are actually able to, um, to convert, it. by changing this energy into chemical energy into mechanical energy, they actually change shape. And so, for instance, you might have a protein that looks like, it actually does, I mean, the cartoon I had is very realistic. It looks like a filament with two feet, although the feet are actually called the head. <laughs> but, uh, and the, the head binds to the microtubules, and they essentially can literally step the two pieces, the two feet, I would like to call them feet, the two feet kind of, the molecule makes a turn that causes the feet that was, the foot that was in the back to move forward. So, it, I'm not, protein folding is a different issue. There you're talking about the chemicals, the structure of, the, the, you know, the, how the molecules themselves arrange and determine the structure of the protein. I'm not talking about that at all. But that's another important area of, um, which physicists work on, absolutely. In the back over here. 
This has just opened so many possibilities in my mind for the complexity of it. Um, the logs are different from the living systems because the logs will probably organize themselves with some sort of self-organized criticality, I would think. Um, and or, or in terms of the living systems, it depends on how wide the eyesight is of the birds or the fish when they spot the danger. So it seems to me something can be built into the model, some sort of Bayesian probability of we know this, so we're going to go there. And that will also rule the interaction. Um, absolutely. So actually, I, I think Andy Bernal, um, maybe will tell you more, who is a mathematician, will tell you more about uh, um, models of flocking a little bit more in detail later today. But um, it's certainly true that the way you know the logs organize, by the way, the logs themselves, there is also the flowing river. So it, that was truly a cheat. <laughs> OK, let's, let's leave the logs aside. But um, so what, what I mean is that the logs organize, the flowing river provides something like the external magnetic field. It helps them organize. So that's why I'm saying it's, it's really a bit of a cheat. So, but it's certainly true that the laws are different from the one of equilibrium system, as we call them, that you know, equilibrium liquid crystals and so on. Um, but um, one of the things about these uh, Starling models is that they have actually shown that uh, they, we actually do pre use precisely the language, if nothing else, and the ideas the, of equilibrium phase transition. And uh, the Starling model, um, people argue that actually what the Starlings are indeed close to a critical state. So there are some connections to, uh, to what you mentioned, the self-organized criticality and things like that. And yes, there is a lot more to be explored. Now, people are also working on better models where indeed you know, the fish don't see all their neighbors equally well in the back and in the front. Obviously, or, or the birds. The birds, you know, have actually a pretty narrow angle, and so you can actually improve these models by putting that in and, and so on. But to me, as a physicist, you know, what's really interesting is what can you get with the simplest possible model you can make? Uh, to me, that's, that's actually the most interesting question. How far can you go with, with the simplest model? And then if you cannot describe what you're trying to describe, you make it more complicated. But I would say that that's the philosophy of, of physics as, co as opposed to some of the other sciences, such, such as biology and so on. Well, that's true. W with the models you were showing, the greater the noise, the more random the distribution. And as you limit the noise, it's similar to animals being able to think to go in a certain direction. They would self-limit their own noise. Maybe that's how they regulate. I mean, exactly. How do they regulate? No, I just say there's a noise. How do they regulate it? I don't know. That's Absolutely. Thank you. Oh, One is very simple. Just um, we were you were mentioning looking at pretty movies and so on. So at a certain point, the flow that you showed the uh, cytoplasmic proteins looked to me like um, Jupiter's clouds and the red spot and so on. But this oh. is yours. <laughs> if I understood, this is deceiving. That's that's simply yeah. chaos fluctuations and not yeah. okay. Although. Uh, you can use ideas from um, chaos to describe this kind of flows too. Mm -hmm. So you know the math that we use to describe these things is often very much the same. So I had a more complicated question though. When we looked at the starlings or the fish, those are three-dimensional structures in the sense that there's an X, Y, Z. But do they form a 2D surface? You know, are there hollow spots in the, the folding? The starlings form 3D flocks. Okay. Others, uh, you know, these, these not, not all birds are the same. Thank you. <laughs> you know, that's I'm just wondering, uh, with the starlings, it looked like um, the flocks have large numbers. Uh, and you spoke about uh, the errors that occur, um, especially uh, in that influencing the shape of the flock and the behavior. Uh, what I'm wondering is, is there a certain minimum number of starlings that's necessary to result in the flocking behavior? I think a few hundred, yeah. A couple of hundred, say. Yeah. So yes, yes, there is. It is, is, that, is that related to the fact that um, all of the starlings, if there was too few of them, then all of the starlings would be, or many of the starlings would they then be on the outside? Uh, they would not be... Uh, referencing a center, so they would all be kind of looking inward, 
say if I had five or six starlings, they'd all be kind of referencing toward one direction. They couldn't that, be centered. That may be, although we don't exactly know. You know, there's another complication. When we make these uh, numerical models, we always have what we call periodic boundary conditions, meaning if a starling lives here, he comes back this way immediately. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay? That's not the way starlings do. <laughs> that's, that's not the real world. Or we have to put them in a box, and then something very different happens because they might go to the boundary. So you are right. It could very well be that too many of them would be on the surface with fewer guys. To in Although um, the, the thing is, because they have this interaction with the seven closest neighbor, or six or seven closest neighbor, the ones on the surface actually have as strong an interaction as the one in the middle. So. I, it's perhaps more related to the fact that, that we don't generally see collective behavior, as was pointed out here, when we have small numbers. And, and that's true for gas, even, you know, for anything, uh, even an equilibrium system. So. Uh, is there a, a quantity or a, a force between two starlings that you can quantize that would make them come together, or that you can say you that... You, by quantize, you don't mean... Uh, uh, quantize no. in the quantum sense. Uh, no, no, no. Just a number. <laughs> a, no, a number between I'm just, I'm just, if you have two I'm starlings that they'll they come together with a they, like a fictitious force or something. Well, so in this model the force is sort of like the force that drives two magnets to but it, that's not a real force, right? And I mean actually starlings never certainly in, in the starlings, um, what we call excluded volume, the finest size really doesn't matter because they never come close to each other to touch it, each other. So that, that's really not important. But it, if, if they're separate, they'll come to, to, they, they will. They, to they, a certain point. You know, the models we are making um, essentially just put in a rule by hand that they, they, will, um, that they will come together. I, I kind of put, in, put it in by hand. If I were to make a model where things have a finer size, like they are actually rods that take up space, that will also provide an interaction. If they were to come close to each other uh -huh. enough, they would provide an interaction that would make them align. But that doesn't happen for the starling, so that, that's not a good model there. So, so I don't know. <laughs> that's, that's the answer. I, I, I have a more comment than a question, though I like this idea of quantum flocking. Maybe that could be a future <laughs> conference we hold. Uh, uh, that there was a recent study of smaller numbers of birds um, maybe 20 of something that form these V-shaped yes. patterns. I don't right, know if you right. saw the yeah. articles about this in the popular literature, but um, what they found from that study, which was uh, very careful in that they could actually look at individual birds, was that the birds were very accurately monitoring their neighbors to a high degree of precision that that was extraordinary, I think, from the point of view of the researchers. and. So it, it gives some idea that maybe the accuracy with which birds look at their neighbors is much greater than we had presupposed. And no, maybe no. the noise comes from other I, sources. I, I, I agree, but the question in, in, a, in something in a flock made of, say, you know, thousands of birds, the question remains, how is the information transmitted so quickly? And I think... We are arguing that the way to understand that is through ideas from phase transitions, essentially. Yeah. Uh, because even if you're looking very accurate to your neighbors, that doesn't explain how, you know, I'm not sure I know your name, but you there in the back of the room are immediately going to know you're supposed to be doing what I'm doing. So it's, uh, but anyway, but yeah, but, that, but that's also very possible, though. I, th I think it's certainly true that. Uh, Okay, one last question. Yeah, you mentioned about these studies being extended to mammals. What about human beings? Oh, yes. Is human intelligence <laughs> goes against the noise because they can think and, or how do they? Oh, no, no. Uh, I Thank think, uh, and um, am I right that Andy Bernoff will say something about this or not? That's no? a good advertisement for something that Andy might speak about in his talk. So, so yes, they have, they have been used, but I mean, just. Absolutely. <laughs> there, is, um, there is work on describing how people dance in the moss pit. What is that called? Mm -hmm. The moss mosh pit is, um, you know, metal music. And uh, I can show you what they <laughs> if you want. So that's, yes, they've been extended to humans as well.
I think that's a good note for us to conclude the first session, and we're getting ready to break for coffee. Let's thank Christina one more time, and then Greg will tell us something. So let us deflock now, and uh, or, or re reflock maybe. Uh, when do we come back here in this room? 10.45. Okay, see you all back here.